And uh, by the way, we uh, asked Katie to help herself to some of that cherry uh, delight uh, yeah. dessert. Matt, you got a little clarification on the ingredients? I did. I received a text message from the home base that it's Cool Whip and cream cheese is the yeah. mixture in the middle, not the powdered sugar. Uh, it is a graham cracker crust, so we, we did get that correct. But here's the secret ingredient, a hint of almond extract a hint now that's i don't know what a hint, a hint. is is it, more, is it a hint more than a pinch or less than a pinch I, or is it i don't know it more or less than a dash i don't know uh, uh, how does a dash measure up to a pinch or, or a hint a well hint. since it's almond extract it might be a splash it could be but i i'm i Not have written evidence yeah. it's a hint so right, we need more clarification from your mom <laughs> yes it's one of those things you'll never get. I was saying in the, in the off uh, um, time here uh, off air, uh, last Thursday was a, a celebration of life service for my 94-year-old grandmom who loved you through cooking, and there were all kinds of remembrances of her meals and her cooking, And but you never knew exactly how it got made because that's, it was sure. a dash of this, a pinch of that, a hint of whatever. Uh, so how much ingredient do I put in there? So someone else would make it, and it would never quite taste like hers. That's the whole secret in the <laughs> Italian world uh -huh. with spaghetti sauce sauce or gravy as uh, some call it <laughs> it is uh, something that no one ever tells everything that goes in so th the person who dies takes that little deliciousness with them to the grave <laughs> don't you want to leave it for everybody else though i don't know you know the, we'll bring in this guy here because he has a, he runs restaurants that serve food let's find out from senator <laughs> jason barrett whether he shares all of his recipes jason good morning to you sir what recipes <laughs> See, the secrecy is uh, in that uh, it doesn't go away. Right. What's, what's in the sauce? What's in the sauce? You know, what's what's the secret in, ingredient in your pizza sauce, Jason? Um, I'm not sure why you think I would tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I catch you in a loose moment. You Tomatoes, know? right? <laughs> no, no, you have not. But it doesn't come out of a can, right, Jason? That's correct. <laughs> Comes out of a plastic tube. <laughs> <laughs> Made with love. Uh, Jason, uh, how long are you in Charleston for the interim sessions? Uh, so I arrived uh, here in Charleston on Sunday, uh, and I will be leaving. Um, I have meetings throughout the day, so I will probably be leaving in the morning tomorrow. Well, what are some of the main issues that you are attacking? Well, uh, yesterday was a, a very busy day. My first meeting started at 9, and I had meetings all the way up. Um, through about 6 o'clock or 6.30 last night. So um, we obviously had a, finance, a joint finance committee meeting, which we have uh, every interim session where uh, Revenue Secretary Dave Hardy um, you know, always outlines uh, where we are uh, in the fiscal year uh, as it relates to the budget. Um, we are in the first quarter. We are over $200 million in surplus ahead of, of, of where we projected to be. Uh, and that is after a uh, the largest tax cut in state's history of, of 21 and a quarter percent uh, tax cut to personal income tax. Our revenue estimates are still uh, way above projections, and, and, and uh, the state is doing extremely well. So uh, that was obviously good news. We had a, a really good month uh, in September. Don't really expect uh, a, a, another close to $200 million surplus in, in October uh, because a lot of the pass-through entities are filing their uh, tax returns, which were due uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, and a lot of those receive refunds. So, you know, I don't know that I necessarily think that we'll, uh, you know, have a, a, a be underestimates in October, but, but I would not expect uh, a huge surplus for October. I talked to uh, Ken Apple, CPA, about a month ago or so, and he made mention of the fact that and he does payroll for some companies too, and he, he was made aware of the fact that some places are not taking out uh, a payroll that reflects the income tax cut. So some people are still being taxed at the old level. Uh, are you aware of that? Is the Finance Committee aware of that, Jason? And is there any idea how much of that is actually going on so that you understand what the true revenues will be after the tax cut is, is all fully implemented? Um, that I have not heard that, and, and I, I wish that I would have prior to our finance committee meeting yesterday because I could have asked the Revenue Secretary about that. Uh, so, um, no, I, I'm, again, I'm unaware of that. I don't, I don't know what kind of impact that would have on um, 
you know, budget numbers and, and where we are in surplus. And, you know, it's unfortunate that that the state has passed, again, the largest tax cut in the state's history. And, you know, their employers or folks that are not uh, showing that in the paycheck of, of the folks working for them because that's money that should be in their pocket uh, every week or every two weeks when they get a paycheck. Matt Miller. Is there a memo or an email, something that goes out to every business when a tax cut is made like that to say this is the new rate and this is how that tax should be uh, taken out and how much? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but you'd have to be living under a rock to not know that the state just passed a huge personal income tax cut. Um, right. To say that we do that every time, I can't say that because – um, I don't know the last time there's been a cut to the personal income tax. So. Mac Warner was on this program yesterday. I had a chance to listen a little bit, and he talked about those surpluses and um, you know looked at it as as maybe they're a little bit artificial, if you will, especially when you look at certain needs that still are uh, very prominent in in our state of West Virginia. How do you answer that? Um, I don't know how you could define them as artificial when we have them month after month and year after year, uh, especially giving, again, a tax cut to the people of West Virginia of $700 million, 21 and a quarter percent personal income tax. And we're still seeing uh, a large surplus of in excess of $200 million in the first quarter of fiscal year 24. Um, I don't know how more real it could be, to be honest with you. Well, I, um, I, I don't know... Is, are, are there always things that, that could be funded and could we throw more money at things? Sure. But, um, you know, we have uh, in the Finance Committee, uh, both in the Senate and the House, every agency, uh, the state agency comes before uh, those committees. Um, they outline and ask what they're looking for um, in an appropriation. Um, and I don't recall any agency coming to us and say we need more money than than what the governor uh, has appropriated or su suggested appropriation in his budget. And I, I think that was the idea that I got out of his questioning was that, you know, th there are needs within, say, our correction system and our foster care system, and that perhaps if those budgets were increased to help meet those needs the way that they should be, then we would not have the, the surplus that we have, that the budget needs to be set properly in that regard to, to help meet those needs and then at the end we may still have surplus but but not as much surplus uh, that, that's kind of what I took out of, of of hearing his questioning of that well I mean as as I'm sure you are aware Matt in, in August uh, interims special session uh, we pass um, you know some things for corrections uh, to help them out um, we've passed pay raises uh, for uh, correction workers uh, in, in the fiscal year 24 budget. Uh, we've appropriated $100 million for deferred maintenance uh, for corrections. And, and we had a uh, prisons and jails committee yesterday uh, where uh, the commissioner of, of corrections uh, outlined that they have already committed $60 million of that $100 million should be spent for deferred maintenance. Uh, in eight different on eight different projects, um, and and I asked the question, you know, was he going to be able to uh, commit that whole hundred million dollars in this fiscal year? And he said yes, that they uh, were being very aggressive to uh, to utilize the, the the resources that the legislature had given them um, to make the necessary upgrades um, in in the deferred maintenance. When you look ahead to the, the legislative session coming up at the beginning of, of 2024, in an interim like this in that finance committee, and, and with what you just talked about that, that was uh, passed and, and looked at at the, the interim, you know, when you go back to August, uh, what types of things are you looking for financially going into the next legislative session? Um, yeah, certainly the issue with foster care and, and is always a big one. Um, I don't know that the answer is always just spending more money. And, and, and look, I'm an advocate, uh, you know, for foster families, foster children, um, and, and figuring out how we can, um, you know, get permanent placement uh, for those children where, where we can, um, you know, continue to uh, attract and retain um, CPS workers, 
um, in in the Eastern Panhandle, and we've done some things uh, with that as it relates to, you know, an increased pay uh, in in areas like the Eastern Panhandle. So, um, you know, I think that we look at the budget from a perspective of, you know, where do we want to be uh, from a dollar amount? Do we want to continue to hold a flatline budget? Uh, do we want to increase by two or three percent and, and figure out what that looks like? But you know, I think the, 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 the Finance Committee and the Senate, uh, at least, um, and probably the House, too, I, I don't, you know, I, I just don't want to speak for them. That's why I said the Senate. But, um, you know, I think that we're um, going to be really cautious about uh, a lot of increased spending. Again, we've had a, a, a large tax cut. Um, we're still seeing surpluses. Um, but, you know, that that's not going to continue um in perpetuity, I think that it's important to watch uh, spending, uh, make the necessary um, expenditures and investments uh, in the state, uh, but also be mindful that we're spending taxpayer money and um, we should spend, um, you know, as little of that as possible uh, or necessary. Bill Kearns. I, <clears throat> I, uh, I agree, uh, and I really didn't think about it either until Rob had mentioned about the uh, payroll taxes, Jason, and and I know with our area, as as you are aware, the uh, amount of um, small businesses that we have that um, might have mom and pop um, owner operated um, with a couple couple employees that they do their own payroll that they they may not have been aware of the new tax tables that you have to use if you're a larger business you're going to probably use either a cpa such as ken apple or use um payroll subscriptions it's automatically updated um but there so that 200 million uh surplus could be could be a little over inflated um compared to what we're going to have at the end of the year but um I think being cautious about spending is, is very wise and um, that we don't want to spend everything we have at the state level. But yet we also need, as we talked about a little bit earlier, about child protective services workers, and um, especially within our local area here, we need to we need to invest. We need to invest in um, having those those salaries that we can attract, so that we're, that we're not um, looking at bringing in thirty thousand dollars social workers. Um, we need to pay them for the time that they're uh, that, that they've invested into their careers, as well as also the 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 um, for the job duties that they're undertaking, the emotional stress. So. Um, it would be great to be able to look at DHHR as far as um, continue to look at locality locality funds for areas that are uh, that are contiguous to the counties or states that's that's paying more. Yeah, I think uh, you know you mentioned locality pay. I think that's something that's incredibly important. Um, and I think the next time you have a member of the House of Delegates on, you should ask them about it because uh, we were <laughs> able to pass a locality pay bill out of the Senate thirty three to nothing. Um, they, they passed the same bill out of the House Finance Committee, uh, but were concerned or, or couldn't get the votes out of uh, the entire House. And, um, you know, they parked the, the locality pay bill in the Rules Committee. So um, I, I'm not, you know, we've looked at this and I've looked at this in my now nine-year career in the legislature of, of a way to figure it out. And uh, I was able to, to figure out a, a plan that got 33, that got a unanimous vote out of the Senate and uh, the House couldn't get the votes for it. So um, I don't know what else to, I don't know what else to send to them. Will that come so back that's, up that's again, Jason? Will, will that come back up again and get a bit more momentum in January? Uh, I mean, you know, I'll introduce the same bill, but I don't, I don't know the point of sending them with another bill that they can't get the votes for. So mm-hmm. at this point, I think the ball's in their court. I'd agree. And, and let me be clear. Yes. The Eastern Panhandle members of the House are uh, were advocates for that bill, uh, did everything they could to try to get the support. Several of them were on the Finance Committee uh, in the House where I testified, and, and they, they were absolutely helpful. Um, but, again, you know, we have approximately 10 percent uh, of the state's population and 10 percent of 10 percent of the representation. So um, you need support from, from other areas of the state. and. Um, the House of Delegates just couldn't get that. Was there an effort to change the terminology uh, that that last legislative session, as opposed to locality pay, some sort of a cost of living? I mean, I know it's exactly the same thing, but wasn't the, the Eastern Panhandle pay? It, it, well, I mean, it just seems like the the whole idea, the the term itself, locality pay, to 
folks and representatives in the southern part of the state, for whatever reason, seems to to just go over their heads? Uh, the term locality pay or cost of living, I don't believe, was mentioned in the legislation. Uh, it, it, the cost of living may have been uh, listed in the in the legislative findings, which were in the very beginning of the bill, uh, but in, in the real substance of the bill, it was more about market rate, and it was about market rate. Uh, is that um, you know when you're you, you look at an area like the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, and, and you're looking for an employer, you're looking at what the market rate is uh, in the private sector, um, you know, the public sector public sector, uh, sector has to be competitive, uh, and that's what it was about. Uh, it, it was about giving state agencies the flexibility uh, to in, to come up with a plan, and that's, that's what it called for. It called for every state agency uh, to uh, identify areas that have um, – a, uh, what the market rate was in the private sector uh, and come up with a plan to be able to retain and recruit employees um, in, in certain areas of the state that had uh, a, a tremendous need um, and, and give the, the agency the flexibility after that uh, to provide additional salaries uh, to those areas where the market rate uh, is significantly higher. And that's a market rate on the cost of a home? It's, no, it's the market rate of of, of a salary. And I think that's, you know, we, we talk about housing and the housing index all the time, and we've been trying to sell that down here for a decade or more, um, and it hasn't worked. And I, I think that it's, it's better. Uh, I think we were able to get all the support, uh, unanimous support in the Senate because it wasn't about cost of living. It wasn't about the home price. Uh, it was about what is the private sector paying for a similar job? Um, and I think that's that's why we were able to be so successful with this bill in the Senate uh, was because it, it called every agency to come up with a plan that worked specifically for their agency uh, and to compare uh, the salaries uh, in the private sector against those in the public sector. And again, given the flexibility to those specific agencies, um, to do what was best to recruit and retain employees. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here on the program. Jason, when you go back in January, it'll be a very interesting final year of this uh, uh, legislative session because of how many people in leadership are going to be pursuing other uh, elected offices uh, or just leaving. And I know turnover is a part of elective office. In the nine years you've been in, can you think of a time when there's been more than what you'll be facing when you get back to Charleston in January? Um, I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, I think maybe you could make the case uh, for the 2014 election where um, the the uh, majority switched from Democrat to Republican, and there were a lot of people that you know, lost that election, including me, not that I was in leadership at the time, but um, – so I think that that's the only comparison that I'm aware of. The, the only year that I think you compare, and you know, really in the Senate, I don't I don't know that you're going to see that. I think you're seeing, you know, a lot of the House members, which, which is typical, uh, is in that um, you know there's more turnover usually in the House than the Senate, and you know only half of the senators are up, so that that plays a pretty big role in, in you know the amount of turnover, um, you know. But you've seen in the House um, a lot of the leadership team. Seeking other office, not running for re-election. Um, you know, here recently, I've joked with some of them that they must have had a job fair uh, <laughs> at the House of Delegates because several of them have resigned for other jobs. So, um, you know, I, but you know, there, there's there's plenty of, of, of talent, and institutional knowledge in both chambers uh, to withstand some of those losses, and um, so I don't, you know, it's not something I'd be concerned about. Judiciary seems to be like it might be a concern when you consider the judiciary chair, Charles Trump, is seeking a Supreme Court justice seat. The vice chair, Ryan Weld, is also seeking uh, a seat uh, as a constitutional officer, attorney general. So I'm left with the question, I don't know how many attorneys are in the Senate, but is it important that the judiciary chair have a law degree, Jason? Um, I think it's helpful. I don't think it's necessary. And, and you know, there's, and I think that, that Charles Trump is probably uh, the hardest person to replace in the legislature. Um, 
and that's not because of the title he holds, but it's because of uh, the institutional knowledge that he has, um, uh, just the overall intelligence that the man has. Um, I mean, he is a tremendous asset to the state legislature and to the state of West Virginia. Um, so he, you know, I, I don't know who the next judiciary chairman is. I don't know if they're going to have a law degree, uh, but I can tell you one thing that Craig Blair is really good at is putting the right people in the right position. So um, I don't have any concern um, uh, about the future of the Judiciary uh, Committee. Again, no one is Charles Trump, um, but we have uh, a lot of talent uh, in our caucus, and and I have no doubt that that President Blair is going to put the right person uh, in that position uh, moving forward. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't uh, agree with you more about um, Senator Trump. And it gets to be a thing when you do have such a huge changeover, as I'm sure you'll agree. Um, you have so many people that come to Charleston or meet with you at local meetings in the community. It's, uh, I know for myself, I get to take a trip at least once a year down to Charleston and meet with uh, meet with you all. And it, it's an opportunity to be able to educate and and, and to let you all know what what's going on in our area of work um certainly mine of public health um i i never pass up the opportunity to to try to to meet with you all or at least attempt to anyway and um so it's an education factor that um uh, that we can provide you all the information so you can make good sound decisions because you're not you're not experts in in every agency that you have the uh, authority to be able to rule over so providing that education to you all was key yeah and and Look, Bill, I always appreciate when folks from the Eastern Panhandle make the four-plus-hour trek down to the Charleston to meet with legislators, and, you know, it's important, and, and I know that you take the time to, to meet with all of us and, and those from other areas of the state while you're here, and, um, you know, it, there's there's always been this, you know, somewhat of a disconnect from uh, Charleston and the Eastern Panhandle, and, um, you know, we've been able to uh, recently uh, to be able to to get legislators and uh, key positions and leadership positions uh, down here in the capital to to be able to make um, the necessary changes in the state, uh, you know, to help not only the Eastern Panhandle but the entire state. And um, you know, I think that you have the Senate President uh, from the Eastern Panhandle that is uh, a tremendous uh, asset uh, to the Eastern Panhandle to be able to get things accomplished. Um, so it's it's important for for folks to like you, Bill, and, and others that are that are involved in um, you know public policy, uh, you know, in the counties to to, to reach out and, and meet with us. And again, you're you're right; we're not ex- experts in everything, uh, but I think that we have the skill set to to be able to uh, make decisions and, and and you know meet with you guys and and be able to figure out what's best moving forward. Jason, thanks so much for your time this morning. Final word is yours. If you have anything you wanted to pass along, um, I don't think so. It was uh, nice to watch uh, football Sunday and not have to worry about the Steelers losing. <laughs> but, uh, first place. Well, uh, we were in first place. Then the Ravens won, so we had a we had a buy. So we're half game behind now. Yeah, exactly. So anyhow, I, you know, I obviously always appreciate the opportunity to come on the show, and um, you know, it's. We're, we're down here uh, working diligently to get ready uh, for the session and, and be prepared, um, you know, to to get past legislation that, that benefits the entire state. So. What's the Tudors update? Everyone wants to know. <laughs> That's what I was just getting ready to ask. Everybody What's the wants Tudors to know? update? Well, I'm waiting on the health department. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a meeting uh, we, about we that. We're really close. We, we we're we're I mean really tying up. Um, all the, the the last minute things to, to get done. So I know that it's. Uh, uh, I, I, trust me, I see the Facebook posts in different groups, and I know people are getting uh, anxious and somewhat frustrated. And um, nobody more than me. So we are extremely close. So just have a little bit of patience. We're almost there. Jason, thanks again. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.